Hello, everybody, um, and welcome. Uh, my name is Stephanie Switzer, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar. I am the co-director of the Strathclyde Centre for Environmental Law and Governance, and we are very excited to have here today Christine Frison and Sylvan Aubrey to speak on digital sequence information uh, sharing conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity, time to rethink access and benefit sharing mechanisms. Uh, Dr. Frison is a long term friend uh, of Strathclyde, so we are very happy to have her here uh, with us today. She is an FR, FNRS postdoctoral researcher at UC Louvain and is an associate researcher at the University of Antwerp in Belgium. And she's also an associate fellow at the Centre for um, in International Sustainable Development Law in Montreal in Canada. We're also joined uh, by Dr. Aubrey, who is a plant biologist and an agronomist. <laughs> Apologies for that mispronunciation. He's currently based at the University of Zurich, and he is also a policy advisor to the Swiss Federal Office for Agriculture. Um, Christine and Sylvan have recently co-authored a paper, which I believe will be available um, in the next couple of days, um, which outlines a number of proposals to facilitate long-term coherence in the digital sequence information space. And it is on this very topical subject that they will speak today. Um, before I hand over to them, just a few housekeeping uh, notices. They will speak for around 30 minutes and then there will be time afterwards, around 25 minutes, uh, for any questions to be raised via the Q&A function. Um, so thank you very much uh, for coming here today. And without further ado, I will pass over to Christine and Sylvan, if you wish to put your cameras on. Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks a lot. So I will briefly start. Thanks for the invitation first. That's a great pleasure to show our work and thoughts. Uh, so I will start presenting the ground of the story and how we came out to actually discuss coming from significantly different fields and how we get across the ABS and trying to find out solution that would be fitting with today's uh, contemporary scientific practice. And basically, so I'm no lawyer, obviously, so I'm coming from a, a bit from the side from plant science. I will give several examples throughout the topics I, I, I really know, but maybe to start with basically the, the access and benefit sharing debate and where I'm standing to, I actually start from a, a bit outside the box example, which is this strange graph in the middle here of my slide, which is a GSAID screenshot from this week showing up the actual um, evolution of um, SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, throughout the world. And those are basically a, um, showing up genomic sequence uh, drawn up as a phylogenetic tree of a virus, which tells us about the old variants coming up and all the mutants. And this is genomic data. These are DSI, so digital sequence information. And I found out this quite a striking example, how much uh, these, those DSI these days are having a very uh, bad and huge impact on our daily life. So that's, so to start, we are dealing with an important issue and we try to go through uh, showing some, some ways to deal with it, hopefully in an in a understandable way. So we starting with a big setting the ground of the story. Of course, we are speaking about access and benefit sharing regime, which is the main instrument worldwide to to deal with conservation of biological diversity and the aim there really is to there are three main objectives of the convention which is probably the the biggest treaty on the uh, on the subjects would be conservation of uh, biological diversity via the sustainable use and fair and equitable benefit sharing so you all know that but i wanted to come back to two key concepts of the the cbd which are very important for the following discussion on digitality. And those are mostly the genetic resource definition, which is a genetic material of actual potential value. Some, some say economic value. And the genetic material means any material, plant, animals, microbials, that are containing units of heredity. And here is the bottom line of, of our discussion, the units of heredity 
one thinks about DNA and basically genes and information they contain and make living organisms. So the access and benefit sharing is quite a complex uh, policy engineering uh, machine. And this is dealing in several sorts of silos, which are all big, big and small um, uh, treaties, which are dealing with various aspects of genetic resources, being terrestrial for agriculture, for ant polar uh, Antarctic species, marine genetic resources, as well as some pathogen. And as for each given of these uh, small subsets, historically, they've been developing their way of dealing with genetic resources. So we've spoken about the CBD, but there's also the subset of the, of the, of the terrestrial biodiversity is really helpful and necessary for, for human life. That's the plant for agriculture and the, the plant treaty for genetic resource for food and agriculture deal, deal with this uh, subset of um, of species, but there's also other uh, treaties like the Antarctic species and the Antarctic Treaty, the um, UN Convention to Law of the Sea, and the, the, which deal with marine genetic resources. And I was a small subset, but very interesting for our uh, topic today is the preparedness influenza uh, framework from the WU. And all those silos, interestingly, in the last years, I've come up with dealing with digitization of the genetic resources, which is another way of saying with the genomic um, revolution. And those have been dealt with in the CBD with the Nagoya Protocol discussion, how uh, material could be regulated uh, throughout um, origin and destination between people who own the actual genetic resources and uh, and uh, and the, the targets, but also all the, there's been some discussion and, and we're coming actually with Christine from this side really pretty much, whether well, all the extension of discussion of extension of the uh, multilateral system of the FAO treaty has been dealing with a lot with the DSI issue, but there's also ongoing discussion, very interesting discussion towards um, dealing with the biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction in the under uncloth, where they're sort of uh, dealing with um, an interesting movement towards ABS, as well as taking into consideration the difficulties that other instruments are having with digitization. And as recently, following of the pandemic, there's been also more um, obvious discussion on the global material beneficiary mechanism that could happen under the WHO and around PIP. So the heart of the controversy is really this one. Historically, there have been genetic resources which have been dealt by the ABS framework and regime, but suddenly there's been a new object coming up in the middle, which was this digital sequence information. And pretty much the entire question lies on whether genetic resources and DSI are something different or they had exactly the same thing. And this has to be really having some sort of interpretation of how people understand the spirit of the treaties and how we actually come, come across and deal, give some policy option for that. So Christian will speak a bit more about that later on. But I wanted to address really basically what are DSI and DSI, digital sequence information is of no use to any biologist in first place. There's never been used before 16, definitely 2016. And it's an emerging concept, obviously without a proper definition or not an agreed upon definition. And those are various DSI one can think about. That's DNA, so it's a sequence of, of nucleotide first place in the cell. DNA are um, uh, transcribed into RNA, which are further on translated into proteins. That's the first three categories. And uh, those are um, amino acid sequences. And these little factories, the protein, they are making more, uh, they are making some jobs which chemicals and the chemicals are called metabolite in a cell and these are for example data from mass spectrometry from one compound to try to, to describe how the compound is and all around these DNA RNA protein metabolite thing you get all sorts of data you can have in plants typically we deal with a lot of uh, phenotypic um, uh, data which high throughput phenotyping is also happening which are also digitized and with all, it could be all various data which are adding to the genetic resources. And of course, uh, traditional knowledge can come along with that. So now where to set the DSI definition, there's various opinion on that and we don't have a defined scope so far. 
but if you take the PIP framework for influenza, it has been concentrating on genetic sequence data, so nucleotide, and actually that's an interesting stand. We'll come to it a bit later. Then the studies um, that have been commissioned by the AirTech group from the CBD, which was mentioned actually yesterday in a, in a, in a very interesting webinar, have more taken the stand to consider all the components of the actual uh, accession or organism you're looking to. And then there's been also historically at the beginning, early beginning of the of the of the DSI debate, the ATEC group was having some more some more holistic um, view on the wall taking the entire thing about it. So we can have a discussion about that, but that's to set where where, where the discussion lays really. But the sorry to the, to the why DSI are complex and not so easy to grasp. Um, um, concept in, in itself it's because genomic is complicated and obviously when you take and it has to read to if you take into uh, into consideration really genomic data and so the nucleotide sequences there are not really having there are, there's maybe five points which are making them difficult to grasp and to nail down and to tag with a let's say with with some uh, blockchain or whatever because you can't really assign a given value using modern analysis Blast is not necessarily the modest one, but you also have gen genomic sequence selection you can use. You can have genome-wide association studies where you use a whole bulk of data and the result, which make probably the value of your study eventually is very independent from the actual amount of data you have from the beginning on. So you can't say that this given sequence has been helping so and so much to have your end up data. And this makes the whole discussion very, very difficult. There's a one point that there's not only one sequence, there's one thing that you can patent at the end of the day. No, more and more researchers are funding some so gene networks, gene regulatory networks that are doing some function. And I don't think that's there's not any way in terms of um, IP rights to actually protect some gene networks as far as I know. But it's, it's an, a complication. Also, most of the DSI widespread. If you take a, a stupid example, maybe it's the Rubisco, which is an enzyme which does fixate CO2 from the atmosphere, and it's representing about a quarter of all plant protein on Earth, and it's common to all plants. So, if you, it's interesting to engineer to get some CO2 fixed, obviously, but it's very common in any sort of circumscription. And also DSI are non-static and we also well know if you come back to the COVID example and the, the SARS-CoV-2, we have all variants coming up from everywhere and changing all the time. So this is a, this sort of, there are ways to deal with uh, genomic variability uh, in terms of specifically in the WIPO ways, but this, this is a complication. And eventually the last point is maybe the synthetic biology which has a, uh, interesting ways of using various bits and pieces from various organisms from various ways to make an, an end product and all this re reshuffling and evolutionary artificial evolutionary processes make it hard to nail it down to the actual material you were using in first place so all these complication which I have, have been uh, going through on the plant side in one of the recent publication make it hard to grasp but if I come, come back very quickly to the actual DSI controversy origin, it's really coming from the nucleotide side more to say. It then, then uh, spread to other bits and pieces of the discussion, but really there has been uh, a major advances technically in this field in the recent years. And there's probably three reasons why there's a controversy actually. The first one is simply that there's more data. And this is an example of one single Chinese group which decided to take their, gen their entire botanical garden and to sequence the genome of all the 700 species which were into their botanical garden and made and published it and make it available. So there's more around and there's much, many, many more projects which are sequencing uh, large scale, every, every sort of genome, possible genome. The sequence is cheaper and portable. So that's um, a picture from my lab where actually you could actually sequence your, your genetic resource quite easily while you drink coffee on the bench. And that's, that's fairly affordable nowadays. So having more data, which are easier and cheaper to produce, give you mechanically a situation where you have a better and more output. 
So if they come back again to the plant genetic resources and you produce a lot of DSI, you have a, a multiplication of the various tools you could use to actually make profit out of the, the, the sequence or the information you had from your genetic resources in first place. So in, plant, in the plant field, you can really uh, think about making some new varieties or you, it could be helpful for pre-breeding or breeding activities to for conservation using markers to get some environmental DNA as well. You can get scientific publication, which understand better how the, the ecosystems are working, but also you get to privatization of, so of your findings uh, throughout various plant protection uh, certificate or patents throughout uh, the white one trips. But all those processes are actually more and more, sorry, very much dependent on the bioinformatics and expertise which is put in. The effort into making sense out of the data is the central part. And that's where lays one of the issue in terms of equity, whether the countries which are rich in biodiversity don't necessarily have the means and the experts and the scientific uh, possibilities, capabilities to actually make sense of the data. And that's where it lies into also mechanically also uh, will lead to eventually more privatization of the genetic resources. So coming back to the ABS negotiation, so to say, and I have to say, I, we don't speak here in, in terms of to our, uh, uh, any link to our employers, uh, but it's uh, opinion, but it's our personal, speaking in our personal opinions. There have been several ongoing process and difficulties in the ABS regime. And one is, uh, has been quite obvious in the COP14 and has triggered the attack group on the subject to, um, to commission four studies on the DA side to make a bit more of the capacity building and to try to understand what was the scope, what was the issues, the practices, modern practices. There's been a series of webinars. Yes, there's one on the subject was very interesting to sort of make aware the community what was the issue with this uh, genomic uh, revolution. And coming up from our side, we've witnessed that the, during the last governing bodies of the FAO and the, the plan treaty has been attempt to extend the multilateral uh, system of the of the treaty which has stumbled upon uh, specifically on DSI issue and the way they've been raised but currently there's more work to actually um, integrate the various option policy option that could be possible and more work is uh, definitely going on I said an interesting ongoing work and probably more most of you are familiar with it just at the UNCLOS and the BPNG which also presenting the scope of marine genetic resources is an ongoing very interesting discussion to see how much an ABS system could also get into will live along the, the, the genomic part of it and of course more generally and this sort of thing politically are often having a huge implication we see the the, the impact of the pandemic of the SARS-CoV-2 over our life, surely there will be, and there are discussion, and yesterday in editorial in Nature was coming back to, to it, how much the data and human data and pathogen data are shared, how quickly they are, and how, how fairly they, they are shared. So there will be more, definitely more discussion on, on that and more influence on the way the, the governance and maybe will uh, hit back onto the biodiversity um, debate. So now I will, head on to my colleague Christine, which can continue and precise our thought on the on the on the topic. Thank you, Sylvain. So the the um, explanation by Sylvain here shows you that you really have um, a, a very complex uh, um, and diverse uh, forums where uh, DSI are addressed. Um, and we were wondering whether having a holistic understanding and uh, uh, some clarity on, on what DSI is and how it is addressed within all these different uh, forums would help uh, progress on this matter. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, of course, I'm not a geneticist, I am not uh, a biologist, uh, I'm a lawyer by training, international lawyer. Um, so, my job is uh, uh, interpretation, law, law interpretation. In my PhD, 
um, I have made this uh, exercise for uh, plant genetic resources for food and agriculture under the International Treaty uh, for Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. And this uh, interpretation exercise, uh, which is uh, carried out following a uh, strict uh, uh, methodology, which is uh, explained uh, under the Vienna Convention uh, on the Law of Treaties. Um, I have carried out this uh, exercise over 10 years, uh, analyzing treaty texts, of course, uh, negotiation documents, but also participating in all the governing body meetings. And the key question is exactly what um, um, Sylvain mentioned earlier. How do we understand DSI? Is it something separate from the genetic resource um, under the plan treaty? Or is it something integrated within? The analysis, the, the interpretation I have carried out um, shows that according to me, um, digital sequence information is part of the genetic material. It's part of the genetic resource. Um, and I will not go into the details of this interpretation. You can find it um, uh, in my book um, published in 2018. So I refer you to this. But the conclusion is, if you um, interpret digital sequence information as being outside of the scope of the multilateral system um, of the FAO treaty, then it goes against the objectives and the spirit of the treaty. And the spirit of the law is something that is important when you do treaty interpretation. Um, so this is my personal conclusion as a lawyer on the C treaty. The question uh, here is, could this interpretation be similar for other forums, for example, under the CBD? And um, what impact does it have? Um, would this interpretation uh, um, question issue um, be a means to avoid uh, uh, benefit sharing obligations under these various uh, international instruments? And under international law, you also have another rule which states that until a new specific provision is designed and adopted by contracting parties, um, the current um, uh, law should apply. If you apply this rule to the current status uh, in digital sequence information and, and, and the interpretation I have just explained, well, this means that um, until a new instrument or new rules or amendments to existing instruments are negotiated and adopted by contracting parties, well, until that moment, digital sequence information should be uh, bound by ABS uh, rules that are currently uh, into practice. Next slide, please. And of course, this is, this is uh, very tricky. Um, and that's the legal interpretation. Besides this legal interpretation, you have, of course, political realities um, um, with various stakeholders um, who have various interests at stake um, um, when we're talking about digital, digital sequence information, but also access and benefit sharing. So um, yeah, the last two or three years, uh, several initiatives have attempted to bring some clarifications um, um, and propose uh, various policy options uh, to resolve this uh, issue on a policy level. The WILTI project is one example. Two of our co-authors um, uh, have collaborated with this WILTI project. I will not go in, into the detail of um, the options that are proposed under this um, project. Um, you can find them, the references is, is there. The, the um, uh, um, interesting elements here is that they really made an effort to um, understand the ins and outs from a scientific perspective. Um, so these geneticists who are using 
DSI in their day-to-day -day work? How, can, how, do, how does it happen? And, and what are the uh, implications um, uh, for this? But of course, this is only one view. Um, and uh, next slide, please. You, you can, of course, understand that DSI is not only relevant uh, for the geneticist who's dealing with DSI every day. It has much wider implications. Um, and it, it does have um, um, a transversal um, um, and, and holistic uh, implications that we have not found in the current literature. And this is why um, we initiated this, this research with uh, Sylvain and the other colleagues who participated. According to us, this DSI controversy, it only reveals some inequalities and fragilities of the ABS framework. Um, um, and this is underlined by power relations between states, between stakeholders. Um, and also it highlights the differences in, in, in scientific capacities between countries. So according to us, um, we need governance mechanisms, um, this to be reassessed. Um, and, and to be redesigned and rethought according ethical principles. Um, equity, fairness, uh, and inclusiveness is, is for us um, important aspects that up to now has not uh, really been um, or sufficiently uh, been taken into account, according to us. Next slide, please. So we were inspired by um, the reform of the Committee on World Food Security. So following the two, two, um, 2007 and 8 um, food crisis, the CFS uh, under FAO um, undergo, uh, underwent a, a reform in its governance mechanism. And the interesting, I'm not going to explain into detail how it works, but the very interesting uh, point here is that the committee uh, now integrates um, all stakeholders as active participants in negotiating texts. So um, uh, civil society, private sector, um, science uh, um, organization, foundations, uh, research institutions, um, they can all sit at the same table um, with contracting parties and negotiate texts. And once they agree on the text, then the text goes through a more classical um, um, voting scenario under public international rules. So um, um, inspired from this, we came up with the idea to propose the creation of a DSI uh, um, multi-stakeholder committee, which would bring some clarity, coherence um, in a transversal manner uh, for all of the different silos um, where access and benefit sharing um, um, is dealt with. So this multi-stakeholder committee, um, we don't have um, um, firm uh, um, proposals um, on, on how it should function, but we really think it is uh, extremely important that all the stakeholders are involved in this committee. And that means not only um, geneticists and uh, um, biologists, but also uh, uh, local communities, uh, the industry, uh, conservationists, uh, uh, farmers communities, et cetera. Even um, data uh, um, managers, I mean, it, it should be inclusive um, for all the interests uh, to be, to be uh, taken into account. Next slide. Thank you. So um, we thought that, uh, and again, this is flexible. These are just ideas put on the table and it should be grasped by these stakeholders um, and reworked through. But um, according to us, the aims of this committee um, uh, would be to enable uh, transparent and independent, uh, fair and inclusive discussions um, with the objective to feed the governing bodies and the conferences um, that take place um, uh, under the different ABS uh, instruments. 
the mandate, again, it's flexible. These are just ideas, but um, could be to draw boundaries to an agreed definition on what is digital sequence information, um, but also addressing uh, the need for finance and biodiversity conservation, because according to us, this is one of the key uh, um, triggering points. And why not perhaps drafting a new legally binding instrument also, although this, has, um, this option has many uh, um, um, difficulties that could uh, um, uh, be brought, why not? It's an option. Where would this uh, multi-stakeholder committee be uh, attached to? One suggestion is um, the United Nations Environmental Assembly, um, um, but other options could also be uh, proposed. Um, um, the, the debates uh, could take place under Chatham House rules in order to facilitate uh, um, voices being heard. Um, it is a highly political and hot issue. Um, can you go back? Yeah, thank you. And, um, and of course, as, as I said earlier, involved all stakeholders, which is much wider than uh, just the, the, the DSI uh, um, uh, geneticists and, and um, uh, researchers. Thank you. Next slide. Right, so up to now, efforts, um, and yesterday, um, um, the series of um, uh, DSI webinar organized by the CBD uh, was um, um, taking place. One of the issues is agreeing on the definition of uh, DSI and, and identifying the various um, options. Um, um, would it function um, with a multilateral a mechanism under bilateral mechanism. Um, what about uh, um, uh, uh, copyrights and patent issues that are related to it? Um, um, how could technically um, um, this um, benefit sharing mechanism attached to DSI could function? As you have understood, this is highly technical and, and polarized, which is why this multi stakeholders committee would, uh, could significantly uh, bring clarity to the debate. Um, we're convinced that it could help uh, um, in building trust and, and in political willingness. Um, it could also uh, enable a, a value neutral capacity building. Um, if it's not attached to um, either the CBD or the plan treaty, uh, but in a more holistic uh, um, institution, then all the various uh, um, um, views could be could be expressed perhaps more neutrally. It could certainly improve legal uh, clarity and coherence, um, um, and therefore we hope um, that it will improve uh, negotiation and implementation under the various uh, ABS instruments. Thank you. So, yeah, can you come back? Yeah, so the idea here is that um, once this um, um, effort is made, we hope um, that it allows then uh, um, contracting parties to focus again on their main objectives under these conventions, which are the conservation and the sustainable use. Um, I think it's uh, not necessary to explain um, uh, the state of biodiversity erosion today, but we believe that focus should be set back on these um, uh, two main aspects. Thank you. Um, so, of course, um, we would like to highlight that solving the discussion on digital sequence information will not necessarily solve all the problems that are related to access and benefit sharing. Um, and the two most important ones are the lack, lack of funding and uh, political will. Uh, for biodiversity conservation. So we believe it might be time to rethink this access and benefit sharing mechanism, possibly out of the box. And we're working on this um, right now. So hopefully by the end of the year, another paper will be out. So thank you for your uh, attention. Um, feel free to contact Sylvain or myself 
Um, if you're interested, if you want the paper uh, that will be out in a few days um, or for any other question. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Christine and, and Sylvan. That was extremely interesting. Um, I would ask if anybody has any questions, if they could put it in the Q and A. Um, so, and it, there's a bit, the chat is also open if if you just wish to raise any comments. Um, and yes, the the full details of of the co-authors of this paper as well as the link are on the slide. And uh, this video will be made available on our Scalg YouTube page. Um, I, I say shortly after the event, it'll probably be about a week, uh, but we'll let all participants know as well. Um, so uh, just before we do take questions and just to give people time to put um, their questions in the Q&A function, I, I just, if I'm gonna abuse chair's privilege um, and ask a very, quick question. So one thing that you maybe didn't mention was how you saw, because I'm, I'm guessing potentially there could be a multilateral fund um, established, how you how you would see that fund being managed where it could potentially in international law terms be centred, whether it be under the CBD or is that something that you've not had time to really reflect on? Um, if I can answer that, Silva. Yep. Yeah, just go ahead. Yeah. Um, so we have thought about it. Um, the thing is, we we don't want to. Um, we believe it's not our job to decide upon the technicalities of how things will be implemented. Then, um, um, I'm not a contracting party. I'm just a random independent researcher. Um, and I certainly don't want to tell uh, contracting parties what they have to do. Um, besides, um, so this would be one task of the committee, for example, to design this, this uh, funding mechanism. Um, there are quite a lot of uh, talks uh, going on uh, under the CBD and uh, the plan treaty on, on how a, a multilateral system uh, uh, could function also for DSI. So this idea is clearly on the table. Uh, and I think that um, what Sylvain has explained earlier regarding the difficulty in identifying the role of one sequence in a whole bulk of sequence and the uh, um, final uh, um, product is impossible. It's exactly the same um, if, you, if you have seen already uh, um, how uh, um, uh, a new variety, plant variety, um, um, is bred. It has many, many ancestors and it's impossible to identify who or, or what ancestor has enabled um, a specific characteristic of the variety. So the multilateral uh, um, uh, component of this fund is, is definitely on the table and discussed. Um, um, so these are the two reasons why, why we, we, we didn't um, uh, enter into the details uh, in this paper. Yeah, yeah exactly. If I can complement a bit. Yeah, I think the, the, the idea of the paper of this work together was really to set up, uh, give this committee life, set up a home, a possible probable home that's possible, but not going too far. We have our own opinion, of course, and sort of options which were, but we didn't, we wanted really to stay neutral on this ground, trying to shape, okay, this is really open to anybody to get into the discussion. Meanwhile, that's a good home. Maybe it's slightly less political than when you have a are bound by various parties and treaties where you can actually get a bit on the side and get more details, explain what it is and try to get the option on the table on a, on a sort of more neutral ground. Wonderful and thank you for letting me ask that question. Uh, we've had quite a few questions coming in via the Q&A and, and please do feel free uh, to keep posting. Uh, so we have a question which is uh, this webinar and the multi-stakeholder approach uh, goes in the direction of the idea of a universal solution for DSI, but is there a legal mechanism uh, to approach DSI in a supralateral manner? How could this work? Scientists do use DSI independent um, of legal provenance, but the legal mechanisms seem very unclear uh, to enable an umbrella solution. That's a very good question. <laughs> 
Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm not sure um, if I understand it um, very well. Um, is is I mean, the purpose of the committee is precisely this: to 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 propose a forum where uh, um, DSI could be discussed and handled in at a universal level, uh, so that every uh, ABS uh, uh, instruments would have the same information uh, on the table and then eventually adapt it uh, to their uh, specific instruments. Um, but so one legal mechanism to approach, I mean, on what side? In, in regulating appropriation of DSI, in, in regulating uh, sharing of, of benefits, in um, I, I'm, I'm not sure I, I understand clearly the, the expectations with, with this question. What is sure is that um, um, if um, a uh, multilateral system, uh, if a separate instrument, for example, is negotiated, so we have a brand new uh, international treaty uh, dealing with DSI, and uh, designing a multilateral uh, system of access and benefit sharing, well, this would be uh, uh, a, a, a universal solution as long as uh, countries uh, um, ratify the treaty, of course, and the CBD has 196 uh, contracting parties, so we can definitely uh, acknowledge it is a universal um, uh, international instrument. Um, whether this can happen for DSI or not, it's, it's a very tricky question. I mean, designing a whole new treaty is, is is very long, very complex, negotiations are, are tough. Um, um, and in the end, uh, if some countries um, um, disagree with the content, then they will not ratify. And then the, the universal objective will not be met. Um, so this is why the solution of this committee, which is not a binding instrument, um, um, might be an intermediary, uh, um, uh, but more efficient solution. I don't know if this um, answers the question. Thank you, um, Christine and Sylvan. Um, but two more questions that I think are, are broadly similar, uh, which I'll take together. Uh, the first is, how would the committee that you propose relate to existing ABS instruments? And the second is, given the very strong political pressure amongst CBD parties to reach decisions on core issues, including possible benefit sharing for modalities, at CBD COP15, which should take place this year, how does your committee uh, fit within uh, existing timescales? Yeah, probably in terms of, of timescale, uh, um, if, if we're thinking about the next important meeting coming, that will be too late for sure. Um, but, um, um, oh no, I forgot. What was the first question, Stephanie? Sorry. Uh, how does the committee that you propose relate to existing... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, sorry. Yes, so the idea here, I mean, if, if we um, come back to the example of the, the um, uh, CFS, the, the World Committee on Food Security, um, it provides um, either negotiated text that is then um, sent to the um, uh, UN General Assembly uh, for adoption, that's what happened, for example, for the um, uh, Declaration on Peasants' Rights. Uh, it was a text negotiated under the, the CFS by all uh, people around the table and then sent uh, for adoption um, at the General uh, Assembly of the United Nations. So we could also think of something similar. We could also think of, uh, um, um, I don't know, guidelines, um, uh, uh, information documents um, uh, that are designs, co-designed co um, um, by the, the, the committee uh, uh, stakeholders and then sent to the treaty secretary, to the secretaries of, of all the various ABS instruments um, um, in, in advance of um, uh, their governing body or conference of the party meetings. Um, it would then feed the debates uh, um, of the various existing uh, uh, instruments without uh, um, adding a new administrative and, and, and legal layer to it. Um, um, and I think that this effort of 
common uh, um, information and, and common grounds uh, um, shared within uh, these different silos would be would be helpful. I think yeah, there, there's two. Oh, I mean, our idea doesn't come from out of the blue. There's the CFS, but also there's so we we suggested the UNEA because there's a precedent on a on an ad hoc expert group on uh, microplastic pollution, which is running now, and historically as well on the on the earlier days of the Cartagena uh, protocol negotiation, there have been some guidelines produced by the UNEP beforehand that really helped into getting people to the actual knowledge and technicalities of the of the GM at that time for Cartagena. So there, there are some, I mean, it could could work. <laughs> Thanks, both of you. Uh, I've got one comment and one question, which are sort of broadly similar. So I'll, I'll give them together just because um, of the time. Uh, first uh, question is, thank you very much for your important work and excellent presentation. Could you say a bit more about political polarization among states around this issue, uh, to what extent is this a developed, developing country issue? And then linked to that is uh, DSI data is out there. It doesn't map onto country boundaries. The only realistic approach is to decouple benefit sharing um, and focus on the country regions and facilities that need to be maintained. Uh, so there's a comment more than a question, but if you wanted to reflect on that maybe in, in response to your question about whether this is a, a develop, developing world issue. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for this um, very, very important question. Um, we have seen in, in, in the past decades that whether for DSI, but also um, other contentious issues under the CBD, under the plan treaty, this polarization between developed and developing country is moving. Um, um, I, I, we're not back in the 80s um, where there was a clear cut between the global north and the global south. We clearly have uh, countries that were classically uh, categorized under the global south, Brazil, India, China, who have uh, 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 really um, um, important uh, 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 and uh, advanced uh, um, uh, um, uh, roles in, in, in the DSI uh, uh, debate and developments. Um, so I would rather say that it is the polarization rather um, uh, separate uh, at the level of who has access to this technology and who doesn't. Um, so before the polarization was really north-south and now it's a moving one. Uh, depending on the capacity of the country to access this technology. But another important element to think of is the, 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 what this technology uh, uh, enables. Um, what are the benefits that this technology can bring to humanity, uh, to, 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 to people, to farmers, to, to local communities, uh, everywhere on, on earth? Um, so I would rather say that the polarization is there. And the difficulty here with the debates that are ongoing is that the people that we are hearing a lot are the people who have a very um, tight and direct interest in DSI. And um, this, this renders invisible all the other interests which are also important and which play a role in the conservation and sustainable use of our biodiversity. So for me, the, the link um, um, here, and I, I, I thank uh, for that comment, between access and benefit sharing should definitely be uh, uh, rethought. Um, what, 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 what do we aim at? I mean, access and benefit sharing, the whole concept was set for um, to enable uh, uh, capacity building, um, funding policies uh, in the global south back uh, in, in, in the 80s and 90s um, uh, to conserve biodiversity, to enable uh, um, developing countries um, reach food security, if we're talking about the, the, the plan treaty. Um, so I think that these, these goals should be um, um, back at the center 
of these instruments. And maybe it means that indeed we need to decouple access and benefit sharing because I, I'm reading also some of the comments in the chat. Indeed, um, um, if, if you relate these debates to the practicality, what's happening in the field and what's happening in a lab, I mean, the, the, these uh, um, um, everyday practices, they entail very specific needs and interest. Um, and it's very difficult to make the diversity of these interests and practices all fit in within one similar uh, um, mechanism where uh, um, access depend, benefit sharing depends on, on access. So I hope this answers this question. I don't, I don't know if Sylvain wants to add something. No, I think this was pretty clear, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now I have a very specific question. Uh, let me just scroll up to it about the TRIPS agreement. Uh, whether DSI um, would extend to Article 27 of TRIPS regarding the patentable subject matter? I don't know whether you have any thoughts on that. That's a very, very technical question. Um, uh, and frankly speaking, I, I, I think I will leave that for uh, further discussion because it's it's extremely complex and um, I see we only have five minutes left um, so I, 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 I wouldn't feel comfortable in, in entering this debate right now but it's tricky and it does it does touch one of the key elements um, um, I mean the trip system is there to um, enable uh, a fair retribution financial retribution to um, um, innovation uh, developers and owners. Um, so we're touching again here about uh, on the question of, of uh, money, fin financial issues. And I think this is really, really the key. Um, but um, um, yeah, intellectual property on, on digital sequence information is, is very, very, very complex and te technical. I think it needs a, a whole webinar just, just on this very good question. Thank you. Maybe in a couple of months. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we've got about five minutes left, as you said, Christine. Uh, for the question, um, uh, I think your main point is rebuilding trust and equity. I'm afraid that we could reach the opposite effect when moving forward with the inclusion of DSI in ABS systems as it becomes extremely complex. This complexity will be easier dealt with by parties that have the most technical knowledge and financial resources. How can we pair this with the aim that we, as a global community, want to focus on the main objectives of the CBD? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Philip, for the question. A very good one. Um, yeah, the tricky thing, I mean, if, if only leaving um, decisions and discussions within the hands of those who actually handle DSI, if, if I understand correctly uh, uh, your comment, I, I think it's dangerous. I think it's dangerous because um, it, it then enables um, um, not to see the wider interests as at stake and the wider uh, um, 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 how can I say, uh, impact that these discussions uh, can, can bring to. I mean, uh, I, I, I have a very clear example here at my university. I, I've, there's a renovation in our lavatories and we women have asked to have a specific uh, arrangement in the lavatories to answer our uh, needs when we have our periods. Well, we have to fight for it. And it's, it's easily understandable. The men who design these lavatories are men, so they don't know what we need. But of course, lavatories are there and they are used um, potentially by everybody. But those who are in charge of the discussion and of the uh, finding solution, well, because they do not know what our realities are, they cannot fit that in their thinking and implementation in the solution. So this is really why one of the core elements uh, uh, in, in this multi-stakeholder uh, proposal is that everybody is there at the table. 
not just um, the ones who um, have the hands on, on DSI. Um, and of course, the question of, uh, um, um, it, will it will make it difficult for access and benefit sharing, but access and benefit sharing is already a complex issue. I mean, it's years and years that uh, uh, publications and contracting parties are having difficulties in implementing that mechanism, which is why in the end, we're proposing to rethink that mechanism. Um, but I wouldn't use it as an argument to um, um, exclude some, some um, um, stakeholders from, from the discussion, uh, de definitely not. I'm not sure I understood, um, um, maybe, maybe I, I got it wrong, and this is why these webinars make it quite difficult. I, I would have liked to have Philip in front of me and, and, and discuss it with him, but... Um, yeah, um, I hope this answers the question and comments. Thank you. And then there's just time for one final question. Um, it seems difficult to have rules for genetic resources and DSI in dis different instruments. It'd be interesting just to get any um, comments that you have on that proposition. Can, can you say that again? Sorry. Uh, so it seems difficult to have rules for genetic resources and DSI in different instruments. Um, so it's a comment, I think, as well as a question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, if, if, if you go back to my slide on the interpretation, I mean, for me, DSI is just one way that the data slash information slash knowledge that is attached to the genetic resources. It's just one form of it. Uh, like DNA is one form, DSI is one form, but also, um, um, I don't know, a, a, a characteristic that is written on the passport data of a um, um, variety. That is also information that um, is paired with the genetic resource. I mean, you can't, what can you do with a plant um, um, if you don't know um, uh, how to sow it, what it needs to, to, to be grown, what you can do with it, um, how it can cure eventually uh, from, from an illness, the knowledge, the information and the data, depending on how you cut things uh, uh, in, in, in smaller pieces, is all important and, and part of the genetic resource. And this is exactly the exercise I made uh, in, in, in the treaty interpretation. Um, um, all this information that is related to the genetic resource um, enables the use and conservation of these genetic resources. So for me, pretending that it's something separate, I find it, I find it difficult to, to, to um, um, recognize that. Um, so I, 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 I share this, this uh, statement. Um, I think it should be, should be dealt together. But then the key issue again is how do we fund benefit sharing and conservation activity? I think, I think this is the key question and that, that's the bottom line, really. Well, thank you very much. Um, that brings us to the end of the webinar. Perfect timing. I believe it's 11 o'clock UK time exactly. Um, I just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you very much to Christine and Sylvan for an extremely interesting and informative uh, presentation. I'm sorry we didn't get through everybody's questions, uh, but we will forward on all the questions received to both Christine and, and Sylvan to follow up. But thank you very much for a wonderful webinar. Thank you. Thank you. To my thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much for the inv invitation. It was great to be there today and, and share this um, new paper with you. Thank you so much.